I have the honor of introducing one of our amazing history professors here at Ames. I'd like to introduce Dr. Booker. He has been um, doing this event for many, many years, and we are so excited to have him here with us today. And um, if you haven't already, please grab a kraut burger and make, so make yourselves comfortable. I'll turn it over to Dr. Booker. I can't. Thank you. I, th I can't think of anything more Weld County than having a kraut burger while you're listening to an academic lecture. I think that that's just fantastic, right? So enjoy your Schwartzes as you're listening to, this, this is an unfortunate thing that I have to talk about today. And as I was talking to an individual just a second ago, unfortunately, what I'm going to be talking about today is kind of a warning uh, as to what can happen even in a uh, advanced society like ours if uh, dominant groups of people start to deem uh, other groups, and I stress that, other groups of people as undesirable, as evil, as virus, or cancerous in society, the ultimate uh, end game to that uh, is getting rid of whatever that threat to society is. So what I wanted to talk about today is one of my areas of expertise, which is uh, this idea of civil religion, a secular religion, a political religion that uh, took hold in German society uh, beginning in the 1920s and obviously lasting through the middle part of the 1940s. I want to start off this discussion uh, with a description by William Shirer of a civil religious Nazi ceremony in Nuremberg in 1934. And I think what this will do is it will kind of give us an idea of what we're, we're talking about uh, when we mention this idea of Nazi civil religion. So uh, Schreier says, this morning's opening meeting at the Leopold Hall on the outskirts of Nuremberg was more than a gorgeous show. It had something of a mysticism, a religious fervor of an Easter or a Christmas mass in a great Gothic, Gothic uh, cathedral. Shearer described how the packed hall was electrified when the band played the Badenweiler March, a, Bav 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 excuse me, a Bavarian military march by George I. This music was only used for Hitler's entrances. As Hitler arrived, along with other not leading Nazis, he was met by saluting followers. Klieg lamps were used to dazzle the stage uh, where he then sat, surrounded by a hundred or so party officials, an army, uh, and Navy officers as well. As the music died down, Rudolf Hess read out the names of Nazi martyrs, uh, those who had died fighting for the movement while behind the assembled men was the blood flag that had been paraded in the streets of Munich on the day of the failed Beer Hall Putsch in 1923. Scheer concluded in such an atmosphere, it was no wonder then that everybody, uh, uh, every word dropped by Adolf Hitler seemed to be inspired from on high. Man's, or at least German's, critical faculty is swept away in such moments, and every lie pronounced is accepted as high truth itself. This powerful recollection from the early days of the Third Reich makes one consider how supernatural faith and secular politics, customs, traditions, are oftentimes blurred by fascism. The creation of new secular symbols uh, and civil religious rituals like Nazi party rallies to invoke belief in a higher cause and celebrate blood sacrifices are central and a critical uh, concept familiar to many history, uh, historians of fascism and communism, this idea of civil religion. From 1933, Nazi rallies were held annually at purpose-built grounds, mainly in Nuremberg. And I've actually, uh, it was very strange, when I went to see England play Sweden in the World Cup in 2006, I actually parked my rental car in the Reichsparty Galanda, where Hitler staged the, uh, his mass rally that was taped by Lenny Riefenstahl, Triumph in the Will, you know, where most of those large workers and soldiers rallies were held in Nuremberg. Each of these Nuremberg rallies, each of these ritual celebrations had a number of defining characteristics, including Nazis in immaculate coordinated military dress. M marches by soldiers with flags, with German flags, with Nazi flags, accompanied oftentimes by drums and bugles. 
torchlight. I think a lot of us have seen uh, photographs of the, the torchlight processions that were oftentimes held in the nighttime surrounding these rallies in Nuremberg. The coup de grace, the crescendo of the annual pilgrimage to Nuremberg were speeches by Hitler and other Nazi party officials. The rallies were elaborate civil religious displays designed to show German people that their country was powerful. You have to understand when these things are happening. These things are happening in the shadow of the Treaty of Versailles. These rallies are happening when the German people feel like they are on their knees, when the rest of the world is against them, when the rest of the world is punishing them. These rallies, like I say, they show power, they show order, they show that Germany is under the complete control of Hitler and the Nazi party. Battalions of marchers clad in marching uniforms bedecked with swastikas, parades, memorial events for the dead, displays by the armed forces were intended to demonstrate strength and the communal spirit of the elect. I want you to notice the words that I'm I'm lo using loaded religious words that were understood by uh, the Nazi devotees. This discussion examines the making of a distinct and identifiable civil religion of Nazism in Germany. Devout members of the Nazi party were loyal to Adolf Hitler and they aggressively and virulently defended the bigoted ideologies that he espoused. He had they, excuse me, adherents had an unconditional, almost covenanted loyalty to Adolf Hitler. Adolf Hitler was the symbol of the Nazi state. Adherents were willing to protect, strengthen, and expand the German Reich at any cost. Those perceived as enemies of Hitler. Those perceived as enemies of Nazism were ultimately considered enemies of Germany. They were deemed undesirable. They were deemed dangerous. And ultimately, they were neutralized. Nazi civil religion included a constellation of institutions, symbols, standards, and practices that provided adherents with a sense of belonging, a sense of history a sense of sacredness, and most importantly, for many people in this room, for many people listening, a sense of destiny. It was identified through Nazi civil religious community of believers' holidays, their heroes, their folklore, and most importantly, their observances of rituals like these rallies. Roland Sherrill argues that civil religion is a form of devotion, of outlook, of commitment that emotionally and physically binds members of an identity group together. Nazi institutional frameworks were bound by their common devotion in a, to a generally defined post-World War I German nationalist sacred cause rooted in deep-seated deep resentment caused by the Treaty of Versailles. And this is very important. Hitler was seen as a messianic figure. He was a deliverer. Pay very close attention to the words that are about to come out of my mouth because he believed and those who believed in him believed Hitler had all the answers to the outstanding questions that plagued post-war German society. He alone had the answers. Beware of politicians who claim that they alone have the answers. Michael Burley eloquently states that the essence of the Nazi creed was a redemptive story of suffering and deliverance, a sentimental journey from misery to glory. Since the earliest days of Hitler's involvement with the National Socialist Party, with the National Socialist cause, he preached a message of sacred sentimental belonging by virtue of race and nation. That idea resonated with the helpless, the hopeless, the defeated people of Germany. There was a prevailing 
biblically inspired narrative of search and discovery amongst the Nazi loyalists that saturated the language of, the, of, the, of their secular cult. Hitler and the German Volk, the German people, miraculously found each other in Germany's most desperate hour. At the mass rally held in Nuremberg, September 13th, 1936, Adolf Hitler stated, That is the miracle of our age, that you have found me. And after he said that, there was a lengthy applause, right, with salutes and people losing their mind like they were teenagers at a dang Beatles concert or something like that. I think I just dated myself. Hitler then said that you have found me among so many millions and that I have found you. That is Germany's good fortune. Germans who supported Hitler shared the common goal of uniting like-minded Germans together to celebrate their common identity through a variety of rituals to claim and maintain, maintain physical and ideological space through various forms of ritual and physical aggression. Nazis were bound by a shared sense of identity, a shared sense of common devotion to the general tenets and the symbols of the party. Our discussion today again presents this idea that the institutional framework of Nazi culture under Hitler can be conceived as a civil religion. Nazi civil religion functioned to bind members of the Nazi or whatever this, this so-called mythological idea of the Aryan identity group together in common cause against what they considered to be the ongoing incursion of the devious forces of Jews and communists, Western capitalists, and other real and imagined enemies of the people. The ranks of... Nazi civil religious group in Germany were overwhelmingly comprised of nationalists from a large range of different socioeconomic backgrounds who saw themselves as representing an Aryan elect destined to rule over their enemies. For intensely devoted Nazis, the civil religion of Nazism provided a sense of ultimacy and intimacy through an understood system of rituals and folklore, symbols, moral values related to the German people's shared ex experience in historical conflict and victimization. You know, once a group ex accepts victim status, anything is really possible. Once a uh, 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 group accepts victim status like the Germans did after World War I. Anything is permitted because the cake of custom and morality have been broken in the process of victimization. Society's customs, their moral values are no longer owed any respect. Think about that in modern American politics. Restraint, freeing the victimized party to uh, act uh, on, basically on their own higher law. The memory of the, of the past conflict, past victimization, is kept alive through regular gathering, through uh, regular commemorations of past struggles. These remembrances, remembrances like marches, remembrances like rallies and commemorative parades serve to reinforce the ideals of the identity group, the sacredness of the contemporary Nazi group. Jean-Jacques Rousseau coined the term civil religion. In book four of his work called The Social Contract back in 1762, and from Rousseau's standpoint, Civil religion basically is an inorganically created, top-down phenomena that was an essential ingredient in constructing a unified and stable nation. Rousseau reasoned that uh, in a more secular post-enlightenment world, um, in, he reasoned that this idea in this post-enlightenment world the development of an agreed upon civil religion would define a common morality and help maintain a sense of community and cohesiveness among members of society. 
He believed that it was important for the sovereign, for the state, to establish articles of purely civic faith not exactly as dogmas of religion, but as sentiments of social commitment. The creation of national civil religion would lead to the legitimization of the state as the primary object of devotion, of a united citizenry. And in this Rousseauan model, the civil religion of the state, it was artificial. It was imposed from the top. It was imposed on society from above. And the individual was expected to identify, at least to a point, with the emblem of the state and all it represented. For Rousseau, it was a top-down phenomena. Over 100 years after Rousseau published uh, The Social Contract, Emile Durkheim revisited the idea of civil religion in his work, The Elementary Forms of Religious Life. Durkheim believed that civil religion was not made or manipulated by the sovereign, by the state, but spontaneously emerged from society itself. The organization of Nazi civil religion followed the Rousseauan model. It was a top-down phenomena that was reinforced and strengthened by a highly orchestrated top-down series of ritual observances of the co collective triumphs and tragedies of the German people. These commemorations gave meaning and informed the overall value system of the identity group. Solidarity within the civil religious group is dependent on the groups regularly gathering together, often in some type of ritual celebration, to rekindle what, what Durkheim called the collective effervescence of the past. Durkheim believed that these gatherings, uh, they brought the imagined community together and they allowed the individual the opportunity to renew and strengthen the bonds that attached him to society. Thus, in Durkheim's view, civil religion was a byproduct of society itself. It was strengthened, it was preserved every time members of the imagined community gathered together in ritual celebration. Loyalty and devotion to the civil religious group was naturally diffused throughout the whole of society and spontaneously diffused every time a group got together and celebrated. Rituals like Nazi party parades or mass gatherings or rallies brought members of the Nazi group together. Not members of the Nazi civil religious group together under the same transcendent banner of German nationalism and I think most importantly to them Aryan supremacy. Sociologist Robert Bela brought renewed attention to the idea of civil religion with his publication, uh, The American Civil Religion in 1967. And he argues for an existence of a sim civil religion that embodies a set of symbols, ideological beliefs, ritual practices, and organizational structures that sought transcendent meaning in the nation. Bella believed that civil religion is embodied in a collection of beliefs, symbols, rituals with respect to sacred things and institutionalized in the collectivity. He argues that civil religion is a genuine apprehension of a universal, transcendent religious reality. Symbols, songs, slogans, flags, other visceral components of an identity group's ritual celebrations un uh, develop unquestioned transcendent meaning under... I think that that, term, un that word unquestioned is very important when we're talking about civil relig religion and fealty toward the state, unquestioned. You know, when it comes to Adolf Hitler, you know, Adolf Hitler for Nazis uh, represented the symbolic beginning of moder the modern German struggle to defend the Aryan ascendancy from what they considered to be the ongoing encroachment, both visible and invisible, of an inherently evil Zionist influence, social, cultural, and political value system. According to Durkheim, individual members of a civil religious group ritually gathered at regular intervals to reaffirm their common identity and their shared value systems, which were often defined against uh, a rival 
value orientation. In the case of Nazi civil religion, adherents were defined as much by who they were not as they were by who they were and what they represented. Repetitious and ritualistic community gatherings sustain and strengthen the continuity of the civil religious groups. These Nazi party rallies serve to present the Nazi regime's self-image domestically and abroad and were intended as an embodiment of the Volksgemeinschaft, the Volksgemeinschaft, the, the people's community, and also embodied the Fuhrer, the idea of the Fuhrer myth. Parades and goose-stepping marches with omnipresent matching uniforms and um, Public military displays are directly related to the Nazi state's preparation for conflict with the enemy other. So when we look at these rallies, when we look at parades, what is happening there is this is, this is like I say, laying the groundwork for the ultimate showdown with evil. At least as the Germans saw it. According to Nancy Reed, rallies were celebrations of the greatness of the National Socialist Party and the German people. Citizens would come from all around Germany to, you know, they would make a pilgrimage from all parts of Germany to places like Nuremberg to take in, to witness the spectacle and the pageantry, the artistry of a Nazi party rally, performance, glittering costumes, transcendent music, majestic voices relaying the epic stories of the grand German past and present for that matter, all comprise the nationalist German mythology. At the rallies, people from all over Germany came to witness the spectacle, the spectacle of military and social power and greatness, grand speeches, columns of military equipment and soldiers in their best uniforms, music, practice recitations, right? All saturated with the myth of German Aryan superiority and greatness. We are great. That's the message. We are great, but there's an enemy within that's going to do us in if we don't neutralize it. Aryan Germans represented the forces of light in Nazi mythology, and Jews were the champions of darkness. For Nazis, it was a zero-sum game of us versus them. Listen to what your politicians say. They are not BSing you. If there's one thing that I learned in PhD school, studying modern European history, is that when politicians speak, whether it is at the beginning of their careers or the middle or end, they mean what they say. They are not redneck blowhards or whatever. You are to take them at face value. So if a politician says X group is the enemy of the people, that is sowing the seeds for what is to come. In 1921, Hitler stated, I can imagine Christ, here we go, I can imagine Christ as nothing other than blonde head with blue eyes. The devil, however, with a Jewish grimace in Mein Kampf, I read it so you don't have to. In Mein Kampf, Hitler described Aryans as divine, representing them as the highest image of the Lord. That's Hitler's words. For devout Nazis, Jewish people represented the nullification of the Aryan gods given ascendancy to the German people. In 1926, Joseph Goebbels stated that the Jew is indeed the Antichrist in world history. Sentiments like these tapped into latent prejudices against Jews that were interwoven into custom and tradition in Central Europe for eons, since at least the medieval period. For 20 years, the census of Germans were content, more than 20 years, the census of Germans were assaulted with anti-Semitic propaganda designed to desensitize ordinary people to Nazi bigotry. Let that sink in. 
if you say X group is the enemy of the people long enough, certain idiots in society will start to believe that. I don't use the most eloquent academic terminology every now and again when I'm talking about dirty Nazis, so you'll have to forgive me. Nazi civil religion provided individuals within the German nationalist community with a comprehensive framework for understanding their shared historical experience. Periodic ritual gatherings like these mass rallies, like I say, they reinforce uh, their cause with a sacred quality. The idea uh, of the cultural aspects of civil religion of Nazi, Nazism uh, have some sort of sacred quality depended on the perception of its unquestioned inviability by members of the group. Like traditional supernatural religions, ideas and mission of the, the Nazi civil religious group represented what Michael Burley called a sacred cause. A sacred cause that was worthy of devotion, reverence, and blood sacrifice. The belief system, the moral values that defined what a, a group considered sacred dictated that it was noble to sacrifice oneself in defense of the sacred when it was under threat. The idea of the nobility of sacrifice was a key component of Nazi civil religious practice. Nazi believed that the preservation of the German people against outside threats was a sacred duty worthy of blood sacrifice. Members of the civil religious group are thus willing to kill and die for the truth as they understand it. When Nazis spilled blood in defense of the Fuhrer, the Volk, the Reich, it was to be sanctified through ritual commemoration because it was decreed by God. Michael Burley states that Nazi loyalists were led to believe God had chosen not the German people, but the Aryan Germanic race for his divine purposes, something that chimed with long-standing Protestant German belief that, uh, in the nation's divine chosenness in good times and in bad. The sacred blood sacrifice of Nazi martyrs was immortalized in ritual parades, songs, chants, poems, festivals, folklore. What constitutes a civil religious group in any given historical period is the memory of the last blood sacrifice. What should come to mind here in the case of the Nazis are German nationalist traumas like World War I, the Beer Hall Putsch in 1923. It was the ongoing commemoration, uh, the glorification of the memory of the last blood sacrifice that made for the cause, the last blood sacrifice that was made for the cause by the Volk that sustained the nationalist civil religious during the Nazi period. This idea of the sacred quality of the people, the Volk, was even reinforced by German religious leaders. Distinguished German uh, Lutheran theologian uh, Paul Althaus argued that the creation of God, the Volk, is a law of our life. We are responsible for the inheritance, the blood inheritance, the spiritual inheritance that is persevered in distinctive style and authenticity. Althaus argued that Germans were unconditionally bound to faithfulness and responsibility so that the life of the Volk, the people, as it had come down to us not to be contaminated or weakened through our fault. This is a religious leader. We are bound to stand up for the life of our people, even to the point of risking our own life. Nazis convinced themselves that Germans were victim of a targeted international Jewish conspiracy after World War I. Nazi leaders justified their genocidal policies with nationalist arguments. Why did the Nazis engage in mass violence against the Jews and other groups? The answer is to preserve the civil religion, the national identity, the uniqueness of the nation. Nationalist civil religion was the main provider of characteristics, labels, stereotypes in describing the enemy other. And over time, traditional prejudices in Germany and beyond were activated and made part of a sacred cause of Nazism. 
according to Daniel Goldhagen in his work, Worse Than War, when societies, when certain groups come to uh, become unwilling to compromise with populations they have problems with, when they have com that they have conflicts with or see as a danger, it is determined that that threat to the dominant population must be neutralized in some way. And just like in traditional supernatural religion, evil must ultimately be exterminated to make room for good. Goldhagen argues, and I, and I always follow this recipe when trying to understand what leads to mass death, what leads to genocide. Because usually genocide doesn't just happen. Usually there are stepping stones to, to genocide, right? And what Daniel Goldhagen points out is there are essential, essentially uh, five principal approaches to his idea of eliminationism. He identifies transformation, repression, expulsion, prevention of reproduction, and ultimately extermination. The Nazis employed each of these in seeking to fulfill their sacred cause against the Jews and other groups deemed undesirable by the state. I'm going to break these apart because I think it's important that we understand what we mean by each of these different ingredients of eliminationism. So the first one, transformation, includes the destruction of a group's essential, defining political, social, and cultural identities. Let me say that again. So Goldhagen tells us that transformation, changing a group, how a group of people is identified. Transformation, those of y'all that have taken my Colorado history class, uh, when we talk about the idea of killing the Indian but saving the man, killing the soul of the Indian by sending their babies off to boarding schools in Pennsylvania in the East. You don't want to kill the person, but you're engaging in cultural genocide, right? This transformation of the person. You're killing the culture. You're killing the identity of the person, right? The Nazis did this as well with left-leaning conservatives and liberals and other Aryans amongst them that didn't immediately follow in lockstep with Hitler's cause. They, the first people to be transported to concentration facilities in Germany were, you know, Germans themselves that were deemed enemies of the state that needed to be re-educated. Our first you know, concentration facilities essentially are re-education camps. Those are obviously going to be retooled uh, through the 1930s and into the 40s for other, um, for other reasons. Goldhagen states that repression entails keeping a hated or feared group politically and legally segregated or ghettoized. When I think of repression, I think of where I'm from in Birmingham, Alabama. And I think of Birmingham, Alabama at the first part of the 20th century where Jim Crow was dominant. I think of Birmingham, Alabama where African American people were relegated to live in specific parts of a town where African American people had to be buried in certain cemeteries, where African American people could only patronize certain businesses, could only visit certain hospitals. You know, apartheid South Africa also comes to mind when it comes to this idea of repression. And when it comes to the Nazi Reich, obviously the ghettoization of the Jews. Yeah, I mean, the most famous instance of which would be in Warsaw in Poland. Expulsion. Goldhagen tells us that hey, expulsion is just like what it sounds like, simply removes unwanted people from the dominant population. These so-called undesirables, right, are moved from one region of the country to another. And think about American Indians being moved from Tennessee, North Carolina, Florida, Alabama, Mississippi, the Cherokee, Chickasaw, Choctaw, Seminole, and Creek people to Oklahoma, for instance, or the Medicine Lodge Creek Treaty, which right here in our backyard removed the uh, Arapaho and Cheyenne people from the Front Range and the Eastern Plains of the great state of Colorado, right? So expulsion. 
some so-called undesirables or, like I say, moved from one part of the country to another. And in certain cases, in the case of the United States with the American Indians, the case with Germany, oftentimes they're put in concentration facilities, like early reservations were, you know, guarded concentration facilities. Prevention of reproduction. This is, this is difficult to hear. It's a fourth eliminationist tactic identified by Goldhagen. And Goldhagen tells us it, it's the least frequently used. And when employed, it's usually used in conjunction with other eliminationist tactics. Governments who want to systematically eliminate a population can prevent its members from becoming pregnant or giving birth. They sterilize them like we did to African Americans, you know, during the Tuskegee experiments. They systematically rape women so men will not want to marry them, father their children, or in order to themselves impregnate them so that their children uh, that, that, they, that they do indeed bear are, are not purely of their group, thereby psychologically weakening the group biologically and socially. Through their Acti and T4 program, the Nazis forcibly sterilized many Germans suffering from real and imagined physical and mental disabilities uh, without otherwise eliminating them. And also, they considered using this tactic against the Jews. They considered sterilizing Jews as an alternative to killing them. Currently in Ukraine, especially in Maripol and the Donbass, reports suggest that Ukrainian women are being systematically, it's, we live in a crap world, don't we? <laughs> systematically raped by marauding Russian soldiers while, I mean, this is happening right now, while murdering and expelling others. Exterminationism is the fifth Eliminationist Act, Goldhagen states, as radical as it is, killing is often the, the logical next step that follows beliefs deeming others as a mortal threat. Exterminationism promises not an interim or piecemeal solution to a danger, but a final solution to a problematic population. The most notorious final solution, obviously, was the Germans' genocide against the Jews. Hitler's followers first employed a variety of lesser eliminationist measures, the ones that I just talked about. Already in 1920, Hitler, in the speech, Why We Are Anti-Semites, publicly declared that the general eliminationist intent, the removal of the Jews from our bulk, and specified his preferred exterminationist solution, which he hoped the German people would one day implement. Hitler explained, we are animated when the, with, the, with an exorable resolve to seize the evil Jews by the roots and to exterminate it root by branch. When people talk like that, take them seriously. They mean it. People don't just talk like that. Politi politician talks like that. They mean it. They're coming to get you. When I come from Alabama, when George Wallace talked about segregation, keeping the races separate, it wasn't political rhetoric. He meant it from the bottom of his heart. This is an utterly clear and carefully formulated statement of exterminationist, uh, an exterminationist idea. According to Hitler, the Jews are so evil and dangerous that they must be exterminated, and the need to do so was so acute that the Germans should let nothing get in their way. Hitler continued his declaration saying, we shall stop at nothing, even if we must join forces with the devil. Those are his words. So Satan, in this instance, is to be less feared than the Jew. 
this pathway of transformation, repression, expulsion, prevention of reproduction, extermination, are rough functional equivalents that end in the same thing, mass death and carnage. They are different approaches to the perceived problem of dealing with an undesirable or threatening group. I've warned my students about this. When politicians call out groups as being dangerous, and there's a lot of people who honestly believe those groups are dangerous, and they honestly will seek to root them out. Nationalist-inspired civil religious causes like the cult of Nazism in Hitler's Germany ultimately inspire people to engage in eliminationism against a defined enemy other that the dominant cult of personality deems a threat to security, future prosperity, and the sanctity of the nation. Civil religion exists right here in the United States, is among the primary motivators of eliminationism in societies that are wedded to nationalism. All right, thank you very much.